please ask on any matter of practice. It doesn't even have to be on that theme, but anything that's really, you know, a thing for you in your practice that you'd like to clarify or even just share. So please make use of the time if you can. Hello, Anna Krita. Hi. Can you unmute yourself? Um. <coughs> hello. Um, hello from Bangalore, India. And hello. apologies. <clears throat> I joined 45 minutes late. I miscalculated the time difference. <laughs> no um, but I made it and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> oh. um, and thank you very much. I've been really enjoying um, the sit and the walking and the guided meditation and as well as the talks. Um, so during the silent sit, um, um, you know, I was, I, what I thought was I was, you know, sitting like a mountain and grounded and suddenly this thought popped up and it made me like pause the calm and then take a look at it. And um, it is something that is right now um, a sensitive matter for me. And that involves, uh, <clears throat> I'm a mother of a 17 year old who is going to be 18 and who is going to go to college <laughs> to a different country. And the thought was like, uh, yeah, it's so easy when he's around the physical proximity to just anchor me and, uh, you know, uh, and I'm at home. <clears throat> so it, it cannot get more comfortable than this. And then the doubt was, you know, what happens when he won't be physically so close? And can I then trust my practices? You know, what I'm calling as equanimity or balanced, can I, can it, can I trust that, you know, or it is right now coated with this, you know, the curtain or, you know, the hindrances actually. And one of them being this clinging on to, you know, the desire to have him around all the time. Mm. So it's a him him leaving for college. It's a bittersweet feeling, and the voice tells me that you know right now it's more bitter. And as the time goes by, and as if I trust my practice more and more, and I continue with the practices, then it's going to be more sweet. So that's also something you know. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I have a question in there. Maybe I do, but <laughs> that's yeah. what I felt like sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I think one of the lovely things is how clear you were in noticing the thought arise and how it shook your mind a little bit and then noticing kind of that there's clinging there to your son, etc. But um, it sounds to me as though like the nature of that thought is actually the hindrance of doubt. So yes, there's clinging to your son and, you know, uncertainty about what's going to happen when he's not there. But the actual nature of that thought is doubt. It's the hindrance of doubt that's causing you to tremor and wonder, OK, can I rely on my practice? Um, and this is just one of Mara's tools, really, to shake you when you are solid like a mountain. You were saying you were very calm and equanimous and quite solid. And then this thing rose up in your mind. So, you know, whatever the subject matter is, it will choose the most pertinent thing in your life at the moment just to cause that doubt. So it is only a thought. It doesn't have any bearing on how you're actually going to feel when your son's away. I mean, there'll be moments of missing him intensely and there'll be moments of probably, you know, joy, joyful memories, happiness to connect via Zoom. These days we can feel very close even when we're physically far away. So I think, you know, just notice it as the hindrance of doubt and remember how it feels when you are like firm in your practice and just bring that up in your mind when you sit. You know, you can even use that as an image if it helps you, you know, sitting down and I'm sitting like a mountain, you know, here I am in this present moment. I can feel my sensations. I can feel the, the stillness, even the physical stillness, you know, and you just stand your ground, literally. So when those thoughts arise, I mean, it's great to see the impact, but don't get carried too far in the story. It's just doubt. So I hope that helps. Uh, it doesn't mean anything about your practice. The practice is just to keep going whatever arises in the mind. Yeah, I think you're doing great. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Um, right, over to Ashley. 
Hello, uh, Canada. Thank you very much for the amazing talk and um, yeah, sort of um, helpful hints and things like that and the meditation. Um, for me, so um, in terms of guard, you know, sort of guarding the senses, um, it seemed to be more about kind of noticing um, some sort of, well, for me, it was say, a crit unfair criticism or criticism that made me sort of less relaxed, let's say. <laughs> um, and I noticed it, and in noticing it, it definitely started to recede rather than building up. But what I found very helpful, and I hadn't really done before in that context, was noticing um, the body as something a bit slower, a bit more reliable in a way mm -hmm. than waiting for a good thought or waiting for it to recede. So I wonder yeah. if that is a good kind of second step when one's out and about or dealing in business or whatever mm. with something unpleasant is to sort of vote to become grounded or is that it sort of feels like yeah. most cheating or something I don't know but uh, <laughs> it's like yeah. not responding in the way that the person wants I mean you just might, I might say oh I hear what you say but I don't mm. quite agree and then I'm left with all of this mm. you know term, sort of turbulence so I wondered mm. about mm. if that was a kind of good strategy to help in garden senses I really think so. I mean, I think it's an anchor and um, a way of establishing mindfulness really quickly. It's a way of coming back into the present with something that's slightly more real. I mean, of course, these sensations are moving all the time, but you can feel them tangibly like it's an actual experience, whereas thoughts in the mind are very substanceless. They're very kind of intangible and they're full of so much fabrication it's much more slippery in the mind of thought in the realm of thought um so yeah that has been my practice for years to be very very grounded in the sensations in the body um and if thoughts arise it's much easier to kind of take a pause you know you notice the impact of the thought in the body you notice you're reacting to a sensation that you're feeling in the body actually i mean even thoughts uh impressions at the you know ear sense door things that people say they do have an impact on the feelings in the body so if you can handle it at that place if you can kind of establish mindfulness and recognize if you're reacting or you know kind of restrain the reaction a little bit then you're less likely to say something harmful before you've really had chance to you mm. know to um to pause so I think that that's very skillful and after a while, you know, it all kind of, everything supports everything else. Personally, I can't imagine a practice without strong mindfulness of the body. So I think it's a great place to start and to maintain continuity with in daily life. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Cool. Anything else? How did other people practice today? Hello, Tilly. Hello, um, Chandav. Uh, thank you very much for your offering today. My question is a bit more generic about guarding the senses in life, in daily life. Yeah. Um, you started this morning with the, the quote, I must admit, quote, uh, we can't reach the end of the world by shutting it away. And it deeply resonated with me because sometimes you see, you know, a total withdrawal in order to avoid um, in yourself or other people, you notice, you know, the withdrawal in order to avoid the reaction. Yeah. And so carrying this in daily life especially if you're doing some um advocacy or being engaged in uh, uh, fighting any sort of cause how do you balance the being informed being involved and the guarding the senses mm, yeah yeah, great question. I think that when you are involved, um, it's certainly not the time to pull back, as you say, you know, it isn't necessarily skillful if you're in the middle of something that needs resolving and you just opt out because there's other people that will have to pick up the slack. So we take our responsibility in those ways, you know, if we've committed to something, we try and see it through. 
But I think it's more about noticing when the mind is starting to get a little bit unbalanced and maybe um, agitated or kind of the passion that you have for the cause is turning into anger and maybe um, othering the other side, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, rather than focusing on what you can do, you're sort of feeling like you're starting to fight against some kind of something that's making you very agitated. And I think at those times, it's important to realign yourself with the pure motivation that you have, like the motivation of compassion, the motivation of like wanting to um, diminish harm for others, etc. Um, just to try and realign with that and get energy from that instead. Um, and of course, to take a little break when you can, like literally go to the toilet. <laughs> and instead of just going and running out again, go in there, close your eyes for a bit, just breathe, you know, have a few mindful breaths and then return to the situation. But then at the end of the day, say if you've come home and you're still kind of carrying all the thoughts from that day, that's a good time to actually turn your mind either to another kind of topic if you can't stop thinking and if it's you know making you really tired or to actually reflect on the beautiful things that you've tried to do like like not how much you've still got to do or how many difficulties you've encountered but the little things the little successes that you have done and just bring that up in the mind and and just have a look at your mind is it a mind that's suffering a lot if it's suffering maybe practice some compassion some self-compassion you know, if it's a mind that's frustrated or averse to something someone said, maybe it's the time to just try and be with that feeling and practice a little bit of meta towards it. So it's really sort of learning to counter whatever hindrances are most present in the mind um, with something of an antidote to those hindrances, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and of course, that mindfulness of the body can come in all the way through the day as much as you can you know so if you are kind of getting really sucked into something that's happening say you're in a meeting and it's a bit heated you can just literally like pick up a cup and feel the heat of the cup on your hand and just put your attention on that for a while it's like just divert your attention a little bit so that you're still present but you're also grounded in your body because there you'll notice more when the reactivity starts to arise and you'll be able to catch it early if that makes sense yeah does some of that make sense? It does, yeah. I think it's it's finding the balance yeah. through, I think it requires further practice to, to knowing where you are at it in does. whatever landscape you, you're involved in, what, what your triggers are, yeah. and then sort of developing what can be the antidote. So you, right. you, you maintain engagement instead of having to withdraw because it's become too much. Right, right, right. It's a very skillful practice. I mean, if you're able to do this in sort of such important and fairly highly charged work, it's really fantastic practice. I mean, it's it's where the practice gets integrated, you mm. know, and can become a real source for for good in the world. So it's a big field. And I mean, I'm not sure that I have more wisdom than you on that already. So, but also taking rest, you know, you do have to resource yourself by just taking rest from time to time and not feeling guilty about that because you're doing it in order to, to go the, the mile, you know, or the hundred thousand miles. So sometimes we actually have to stop for a while just to, so we have that, uh, we can maintain ourselves for the longer term. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Tilly. Um, uh, over to Nikki. Lovely. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, thank you for the yeah for what you've been saying on the on the meditation. There's a question here that's probably linked to med. Well, it is linked to meditation, but it's linked to my daily life as well. So, uh, and I, I can't, you know I won't go into too much detail because it take too long. So I suppose it's a good thing that I'm, I'm recognising that the things during my um, daily life impact on my meditation. Yeah. <clears throat> that I've learned. Um, so what I'm finding difficult is there's a situation with my eldest son where if I'm guarding my peace, it's absolutely I need to do that. It's because of the situation he brings into my life. So I've had to keep him 
out, but he wants to make contact. I've no, and now I've noticed my meditation. I just can't sit. <laughs> I get so distressed at this. So, um, and it's interesting when you said um, that Mara, because I thought it was Mara at one point when I was when I was at peace, like during the day, I'd be quite content, and then I'd have quite intrusive thoughts, just to say, "Oh, but this will happen," and then it would shake me, and I'd be Whoo, like this. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm asking is, how do I, it's more about my meditation, the things in my life that I know I may need to face or not. It's almost like my body, it's a body reaction. It's not like a, it's not a, a choice. My body's saying I can't cope with my son in my life. I can't do that with my, um, this particular son. Um, and I'll have to be skillful how I address that with him at some point. I've given myself some space, but I'll have to be skillful in that so I don't hurt him too much. But I'm going to have to say something because it feels unfinished. And I think that's what's affecting my meditation is the unfinished business. Mm. Would that be? I mean, I'm trying to work it out. I know I'm asking you, you're looking like, I don't know. I know. Yeah. Um, it's very hard for me to put myself in your situation. It's I, very difficult. Yeah. I mean, there are situations we sometimes have to withdraw from for a while. I would always see it in terms of for a while and try to convey that as well very clearly that it's just a temporary thing and it's maybe as much about you being able to process things so you can give more and be more effective to be able to really help him at some point. So I really don't know your personal situation. It wouldn't really be right for me to comment on that. But um, in terms of those thoughts that come up that just really jar us and really kind of, you know, kind of shockers and warriors and sort of catastrophizing thoughts, I think sometimes we actually need to like talk back to them and say, wow, okay, you know, I hear you. Uh, I, I guess that's what you're thinking, but you know, perhaps that's not true and and actually talk back to these things and say well maybe that's the case and maybe not you know and and try to um reason with that thought because it's having too much power over you it is only a thought um and it's tapping into something very deep some very deep fear or maybe um yeah i mean some of these things can be kind of survival based <laughs> Um, and just to say to yourself, you know, actually, I don't need to, to believe this thought. I'm safe right now. I'm safe. And, and really try to give yourself that feeling of safety by supplanting a thought, supplanting that thought for a thought of safety or a thought of self-compassion somehow. That's an immediate remedy. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, if there's times that you can't avoid where, you know, you are kind of agitated and it's difficult to sit to meditate, you can still meditate doing another kind of practice. You can, you know, listen to guided meditation, you can do walking meditation. It's still the practice because these things are arising in ourselves and sometimes it will be harder to sit and do the sitting practice. So, you know, it's important to remember that you can always be practicing somehow, even if it's not the way you wish it would be. You know, even if it's really active and you don't get much peace, still, you can learn about the mind, you can practice having the right intentions towards rest arising. And, uh, yeah, and that way bring yourself a little bit of peace. So, I don't know <laughs> if there's anything Good. that Good. Can, yeah. it can help. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Nikki. Yeah, that catastrophizing, it's a, it's a goodie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there any other questions? I haven't got anything in the chat box. So any other thoughts? Uh, hello. Uh, I, yeah, I wanted to first um, mention that, that thing that you said about um, about how if we like people or dislike them, it's it's because of the way they make us feel, um, rather than because of the person himself. I found that a very um, yeah, it's um, it's very thought provoking that because it kind of 
it suggests that there's um you know, that we the reason why we we have so many likes and dislikes about everything other people or or other or anything else is because we're sort of relying on the outside world to make us feel a certain way so it's kind of amazing to think about wow okay well if we weren't so reliant on things being a certain way in order to feel good or whatever mm -hmm. then maybe we wouldn't like or dislike things so much maybe we'd just be able to appreciate them yes and it's kind of it's it's amazing actually to kind of think of it that way yes. how maybe our whole sort of relationship with everything could just change if we were just content right within ourselves so thank you that was a really uh, yeah it's amazing to kind of um hear things put in that way um and it's just so it just challenges everything really mm. it challenges my whole everyone's relationship to every everything to kind of really to to, to think about it with that level of um sort of awareness mm. um, so um thank you <laughs> mm. well thank you for articulating your understanding so clearly and so um beautifully because i think that's the thing it's not um you know that we should discard people because of that that you know it's actually more that we can make peace with so many more types of people or situations or situations in our life because like you say we're not relying on them to feed us something to feed us a certain kind of experience because we're getting our own happiness from the equanimity and the being at peace with things you know so to be able to have that equanimity throughout pleasant as well as unpleasant experiences and to make that the kind of refuge for our mind yeah 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 it, it's huge isn't it really <laughs> it's been, yeah and um, it actually works in practice when you are able to sort of be with those feelings in the body and in the mind as they're arising and be economist then you're just not projecting or putting so many expectations on things outside and yeah in my own experience i have noticed how much more um stability and um equilibrium evenness of mind can be there yeah yeah and it's not that you don't feel you actually can still feel quite deeply but you're actually perhaps you can even feel more deeply because you can maintain that stability and that steadiness inside yeah 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 articulating that really beautifully yeah thank you very much would you be okay to mute yourself and now we'll hand over to Ed. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, um, thank you for the lovely day. It's been great. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess my question is, well, yeah, so I, I can quite often tune into a sense of like peace within the body, but then also quite often I notice that I'm kind of stuck in yeah, kind of like a narrow, buzzy kind of headspace where there's like lots of thoughts. So it's like I can, it's quite difficult to be aware of both at the same time. Like, mm. and if I try and just accept and like the, like the difficult sensations in my head, then usually I'll just get swept away. And so it's quite difficult to sort of be economists with them. It's, it's quite, yeah. So I guess I'm looking for a tip. Yeah, yeah. Um... Do you find that the staying with the body sensations is easier than than being aware of the thoughts at the same time? <laughs> easier in that it feels much better, but um, I guess um, yeah. it's um, usually I can stay with the body for a while and mm -hmm. then there's and then it, and then, it, then it kind of gets quieter and quieter until I'm like, wait, where's it gone? Oh, there's this huge mass of tension that I need to deal with. So right. then it kind of feels unavoidable. Yeah, okay. And the tension is kind of in the realm of thought, you say? Well, it feels associated with thinking. Like, yeah. um, it kind of feels like a physical sensation that I kind of label as a thinking mind, but it's a physical kind of... Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. So you might be getting a kind of the underlying energy beneath sensation, so to speak, because the sensations which are a little bit coarser, but then underneath it is a kind of 
if you like, underneath. This is just speech, right? But it's just like maybe more the energetic field of it rather than the actual kind of something very tangible. It could be just that at that point, the mind has calmed down to a degree, but it hasn't quite tuned up enough with the energy of it to be able to kind of handle it, if you like. You know, it's like you've got a fast car and you're not able to kind of drive it yet. So you just get kind of swept along. <laughs> it could be this. I mean, I wonder if at that point it might be possible to say tune into the breath or something so that it's a, still a subtler object than the body, but it's not as kind of intangible as this massive sort of tension as you describe. And you could just breathe through that. I wonder if that might help. That makes sense. My intuition is that I, I need a lot more samadhi, probably. <laughs> so that kind, yeah, of, yeah. That yeah, kind yeah. of suggestion makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it is good to have an object to sort of anchor the mind, as long as you don't sort of try and force it. You know, like if you find the breath naturally comes up and you can kind of um, use the breath to sort of stay present to whatever's arising, you know, just use it as a sort of anchor for the mind mm. without um, applying the tension to the breath so to speak, <laughs> it might help because that's still quite a simple object and over time, you know, it may calm and you may develop more samadhi. But I think a lot of these things, you know, which are maybe deeper and more kind of um, habitual energies that arise, it's better, you know, long retreat is a better place to work with them in a sense. Um, sometimes it takes a retreat, you know, going away for three days, seven days, ten days if you can. And, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and just getting some time to work through. Nice, thank you. I appreciate that. One of my frequently recurring distracting thoughts is planning what retreat I'm going to go on. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Very good. laughs> so just choose one and go. <laughs> my teacher Ajahn Brahm always says, don't take too much time making the decision, but once you've made one, make it work. <laughs> awesome, very helpful. Thanks. <laughs> oh. But yeah, it's, okay. it's all good. Just noticing what our minds are up to. I mean, it's such a strange territory. It's so intangible sometimes. <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. And um, now we have Adam. Hello there. Um, Hi. I really enjoyed the quote, how painful it is to live in other people's imaginations. Um, I was, you know, I, I, I can, I project onto people as we all do, but, mm. um, I also notice it a great, well, not a great deal, but I do notice it from friends and family and such. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how to skill, maybe skillfully deal with when, when you, you realize that you're being projected upon, mm. um, because it does create a barrier between. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah, I'm still trying to learn, honestly, with that, because I tend to take it on a lot of the time. I think it must be me, it must be doing something wrong, or it must be... Uh. So one thing I've started to notice is the language people use. Like, sometimes people will come and say, I feel sad, or the situation makes me feel, I don't know, helpless or something. And that is actually them expressing an emotion. And that is actually an example of um, kind communication or nonviolent communication because they're expressing an emotion. It's a felt experience and it's actually to some extent taking responsibility, right? The, it, yes, it may be caused by a situation which involves you, but they're saying what they're feeling is, and I've noticed for myself when I'm approached that way, I feel empathy straight away because I also know how, what sadness feels like or what helplessness or, or I don't know, tiredness feels like. So then it's like, oh, I'm sorry, you're feeling that way, or I understand how that feels, you know, and it creates connection. But then if somebody comes and says, when you do this, I feel like you are blah, 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 or I feel like da, 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 that is usually a projection, I think. I mean, I don't know, I'm still experimenting, but that is not a, a feeling that they're having. That is a story. I feel like, and then there's a story. So you can't observe like such and such. You can't sit down and observe, um, I feel like, let me think of one. Well, like, like you were being dishonest, for example. That is their story about you. 
you can't sit down and observe feeling dishonest, but you can observe sadness or helplessness. So when I realize it's a story, <laughs> what I'm trying to learn to do is say, that's a painful story or that sounds like a painful perception. How does that feel for you? Something like this, but honestly, I'm not an expert, but I think this might help <laughs> because it gives them back. It, it, you've heard them, but you're actually trying to help them get to the feeling they're having without taking it on. The difficulty with that is, of course, is that if somebody approaches us that way, we immediately get defensive most of the time. So I guess what I try and do is not really respond too much and just say, oh, OK, and <laughs> try not to respond too much at that time and then get some distance and then ask myself, OK, how am I feeling about this? I feel a bit strange about it. I wonder why that is. Um, and then I look at my own intention. Did I do something here that was like intentionally harmful? Or, and if not, then, yeah, then I can perhaps start to recognize that it's a projection. But it's hard. I mean, you're not going to be able to stop people doing that. Um, and like you say, we do it. We all do it. Right. And I think in some relationships, it can be to a degree normal and natural and maybe healthy. But if it becomes really um, because people are working things out, you know, but if it becomes really complicated and you're starting to get really fixed in this kind of bad person box or whatever, then it can be just sometimes not possible to continue in that relationship, I think. Yeah. I don't know if that's really helpful or not. No, that's great. I, yeah, I appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? We've still got eight minutes or so. And you're also welcome to write in the box nice to hear people's voices I have to say it's really really lovely <laughs> another aspect of sense restraint that we haven't thought about much but it's just basically developing wholesome qualities of mind so there's a reason that the Brahma Viharas are called the four protections because they protect the mind and these are types of sense restraint too so if we have a practice with some loving kindness, you know, a loving kindness practice, maybe every day, even five minutes or, you know, give some time in your practice to cultivating those qualities in formal meditation, then that will also come up and really be there at your aid whenever difficult situations arise. You know, you're more likely to have a thought of loving kindness towards yourself in a difficult situation or a response of loving kindness towards someone else. So... It's important to give some time to developing wholesome qualities, even before you have to meet difficult situations. It prepares the mind. Hello. Hello. Who are you? Hello. My name's Sarah. Hi. Ah, I, I don't know if I can see you. Are you on video or not? Um, one second, I'll just pop myself. Well, oh, you don't have to be if you. No. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you. I really, really enjoyed and appreciated the detail and the nuance around um, what we explored today. It was very, very helpful. Um, and I wondered if you could recommend anywhere um, that I could or others could listen to further guidance around this subject. Please. Mm. Okay, um, I would probably recommend like obviously I think I've given one or two more talks on this subject, but I would generally recommend Ajahn Pramali, who's a very wonderful teacher of mine in Perth. He's a disciple of Ajahn Brahm as well, and he has really drawn this out in great detail in his own practice through years and years of cultivation. And I think he really focused on preparing the foundations for meditation in his own practice. And the beautiful thing is that it shows, you know, he's got a certain glow and a certain wholesomeness about him that, that gives him a sense of deep, uh, I guess, reliability. Um, he's deeply ethical and, and virtuous in his mind um, and always seems to see the best in people. And he does talk quite a lot about sense restraint under different, I guess, titles. Um, as I say, anything on, you know, the four right efforts is similar to sense restraint. Um, but yes, Ajahn Brahmali in particular, anything on the gradual training 
because this is all part of what the Buddha talks about as the gradual training. It's kind of, it runs parallel to the Eightfold Path. It's just a different way of explaining the Eightfold Path. So going from um, having a little, hearing the teachings, developing confidence, practicing virtue, uh, developing a sense of simplicity in one's life, contentment, and then gradually starting to notice the way the senses are, are working and learning to guard and protect the senses by developing wholesome qualities and abandoning unwholesome qualities as a as a preparation for mindfulness and samadhi. So anything on the gradual training by Ajahn Brahmali. We have some stuff from him. He, he did a whole retreat on that actually for us in, probably last year as well, wasn't it? Online. And also in 2018, it's on our YouTube channel, Anukampa Bhikkhuni Project is our YouTube channel. But otherwise, you can go to the BSWA channel, four letters, Buddhist Society of Western Australia, and look up some of his stuff. And he's coming to England, yes. He's coming to England in May. So it might be helpful to listen to some of his talks. He gives also a lot of detail, and it's very sutta-based. Thank you very much. Was that Adrian Bamali, did you say? Bamali. So? Shall I write it in the chat? I don't know if I'm able to write things or not. Am I? I'll just write his name in the chat. And uh, probably you can all hear me typing, isn't it? I'll give you our YouTube channel name. Sorry about that. So there's lots of talks on there and also on the bswa.org website. Lovely, Great. thank you. Okay.